got strong taste buds, I think we'll be good. So you return for your role as Tara Carpenter in Scream 6, a franchise I've really come to appreciate for its meta commentary on the genre, where each film becomes like its own love letter to classic horror movies of the past. What are the hallmarks of a good chase scene for you? Like, when they work on film, what makes them work? Ooh, um, for a good chase scene, it's really difficult. I feel like you have to have like a you got to got you got to have a good course you know like the the amount of rooms that you run through i think a good handheld shot is also really ne necessary for a good chase scene because it makes it feel a lot more chaotic and a bit more um first person view i feel like it's a bit more intense for the audience but um at least a couple of injuries a couple of stabs here and there and i also think a really powerful shot and one of my favorite things to see in horror films is when uh you, you can see your your heroin your main character and then you could see the the other um, villain kind of in the background i feel like anything where it's like either they're not aware that they're there or you get to see the reaction and the mayhem going on behind them i think that that's always a strong choice all right too easy there we go <laughs> I don't want to get too confident, but at the same time. You got to gas yourself up as you go, yeah. you know? Well, I feel like around six is when people start getting weird. Right. So you just enjoy this time while you got it, yeah. you know? So you've gushed about your experience working with the master of gothic fantasy and Tim Burton. How did you see his obsession with aesthetic come through in the way that he directs? First of all, he draws a lot of his shots. So there were some days where I'd come into work and he would have his own little picture that he drew of me playing the cello or me fencing him and say, this is what you're shooting. And you would go, got it. Or um, even on the first day when they were trying to uh, establish what my hair was gonna look like, we ran two hours behind because um, no, her braids are uneven. This one's lower, this one's higher. He didn't like the way that my fringe looked at the time. So he was just, hey, can I, do you mind if I do that? He asked the hairdresser very politely and just kind of did my hair himself. It would be like four in the morning in some random Romanian forest and, oh, where's Tim? And he's carrying two trees, throwing them in the back of the shot so that they land exactly where he, want, he wanted them to. He was very specific and like happy to do it himself, but also a really great communicator and collaborator. Did you come out of the other side of the deep dive into his catalog with a favorite Tim Burton production? Mm, I mean, I feel like Beetlejuice is a staple. So Classic. I'm, uh, yeah, I've always appreciated Beetlejuice, but I also, when I was younger, I wanted to be one of the aliens from Mars Attacks so bad, but not the Lisa Marie one, the one with the exposed brain. <laughs> that, I, it, it, I mean, he's got Jack Nicholson, Glenn Close in there. Like, it's an incredible movie. I feel like people don't give it the, the credit it deserves. Wildly underrated movie, wildly underrated yes. movie. All right, so far, two wings down. Are you ready to move on here to sauce number three? 100%. Donis Cadejo here, All right. three spot. Smooth sailing. That one has more flavor, though. Is this psychological as well? Are you like, gonna like feed stuff in my head so that it? I, I, you know what? I do a lot of armchair psychology from this side of yeah. the table. Yeah, yeah. We're a lot of like it's gonna be okay. I do a lot of like I'm a little bit of like psychologist and like a little bit of a motivational speaker. I okay. Feel. That's my role from over here. I think. Good to know. <laughs> <laughs> And then I understand that your Scream co-star, David Arquette, is actually a certified Bob Ross painting instructor and will sometimes give lessons on set. Did you ever have the pleasure of taking one of those art classes? I think I was actually working when people took that class, which is one of my greatest, um, I think I, I don't, there's very few times where I felt completely defeated and that <laughs> is one of them. I, he is like a little angel of a person. I can't believe he's real, but yeah, he gave the entire cast Bob Ross lessons. So we would walk into our collective green room and there would just be beautiful paintings everywhere. But he also had a red tricycle that he gave us all the code to so that if we wanted to get our groceries, oh, let's just take Dave's tricycle. He was um, always hanging out, always like trying to update himself on K-pop because we had a band member who really loved K-pop. It was, he's an unbelievable man. Every but, set needs a David Arquette, you know? Agreed. <laughs> it would make things so much better. Like there would be no world peace. 100%. All right.
That one's actually good. You like that one? That's an enjoyable sauce. Oh, you guys made that. Yeah, I was gonna say, we'll take that. We'll take that, Jetta, all day long. <laughs> Not trying to blow smoke here. <laughs> So I've had some interesting conversations with actors in the past from Tom Holland to Colin Farrell about the challenges of working from behind a mask. What new tools did you have to develop in playing a character like Wednesday whose whole vibe is to be emotionless? When you're gonna be the, the lead of a story, you have to have some sort of emotional arc, some sort of emotional payoff, and Wednesday doesn't actually have that. And I think that fighting the nostalgia that everybody feels for the 60s Wednesday and 90s Wednesday while also, you know, feeding into that, but also giving a new take and, and, and making it your own to a new generation so that they're introduced to the character was like a real balancing act. So I found that, you know, as long as I studied the old material and took traits and, and aspects that I knew I could easily weave into my own iteration, it felt like a good, happy medium. All right, Jenna, you're doing great. This next sauce, Halfway mark already, by the way. Very nice. This is Brooklyn Deli with the ghost pepper sauce. I'm really trying to take it in. So I think it's the I first see where kind we're of going. jump. I yeah. see where we're going. <laughs> Interesting. It has some redeeming culinary qualities, but as you say that, I'm even seeing like, I'm starting to tear up a little bit, you know? <laughs> Should I follow you as well? <laughs> we'll be like yeah. emotional support. Yeah, yeah, listen, yeah. I'm gonna lean a little bit on you. This okay. Interview, okay, Jenna, you know, we can't all. That's what I'm here for. There we go. I, I can tell I'm in good hands. I yeah. can tell I'm in good hands. <laughs> so in a New York Times interview last year, you talked about not being able to care for a houseplant, but spoke very reverently about protecting your 1897 edition of Ralph Waldo Emerson essays. What for you is the magic in collecting books? I typically, I don't write a lot of screenplays, but I do like to write a lot of essays. I am a bit of an insomniac. I can't really sleep, so I just stay up all night and I write random things that, you know, I take a certain po uh, thought or or um, idea and I just kind of elaborate it on, on my own. And someone like Emerson, a lot of his work is essays. So I feel like the more that I read and kind of see the tangents that he